Good evening, everyone. I'm Chris Barnes, Professor of Business Management here at Lakeland Community College, and I'd like to welcome you and thank you for coming to the Dworkin and Bernstein Management Lecture Series at Lakeland Community College. This series is brought to you through the endowment of Dworkin and Bernstein Law Firm. Tonight, we're going to be hearing from Jean McKesh, President and Founder of The Lantern Group. Jean McKesh has designed a state-of-the-art, award-winning Alzheimer care facility in Madison, Saybrook, and Chagrin Falls, Ohio. His fascination and passion with aging was the impetus to design and create a personality-centric rehabilitative, sorry about that, care program. It's a patent-pending retro virtual time capsule to nurture and facilitate memory and to promote functional independence. It's the only care program in the world that is therapeutic in nature and utilizes the individual's environment, learning, and activities to activate repressed memories and stimulate newer learning. Mr. McKesh is on a personal mission to support, educate, and equip the elderly, the caregivers, the family members, and the healthcare professionals with the knowledge and resources about Alzheimer's disease and its prevention and treatment. His goal is to continue to design, develop, and construct a state-of-the-art facilities and therapeutic care models in the U.S. and other parts of the world. And he has authored textbooks called Revelation to a Unique World for Medical Professionals and Caregivers. Before establishing Lantern Group, he held various senior executive positions at Sun Healthcare Group, which is a Fortune 500 company. He holds an undergraduate degree and master's degree in occupational therapy and a master's in business administration from Lake Erie College. Some of his uh, recognitions include in 2011, he was the Lakeland Entrepreneur of the Year and has won the Model Practice Award. He is also featured in various local and international media. He lives in Shaker Heights with his wife and three children. Please help me welcome Jean McKesh, founder and CEO of The Lantern Group. Thank you, Chris. Good evening. Thank you so much. Uh, truly an honor being here this evening. I was just asking uh, uh, Chris, why did they choose me? I mean, there are so many people, why me? Uh, what, what, what prompted or triggered or motivated them to pick me up? And she said the credit goes to Gretchen. So Gretchen, thank you so much for having me here. Um, uh, but anyways, uh, uh, by no means I'm an expert on what I'm going to share with you all this evening. Um, when I asked Chris Friday, uh, what should I talk about? What, should, what, is, what is the topic? And, uh, um, and one of the things she said was, just share your life story. Uh, why do you do what I do? And how did I go about doing it? So I'm going to share my life experiences. Uh, 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 I'm not saying everything that I did will work for you. Um, it may, it may not. Uh, but I'll take you through my journey, my life story. Um, one of the things is, you know, many times, uh, oftentimes when I go on stage, people would ask me, when did you make that decision that you want to be an entrepreneur? And, um, you know, I don't think there was any point in my life that uh, I said, okay, you know, I'm 24 years old or I'm 26 years old and I want to be an entrepreneur. Um, that has never been... Um, uh, I've never been through that process, and, and I think sometimes we may even um, question ourselves and struggle or challenge ourselves sometimes, thinking, okay, am I making the right decision? Uh, one of the things I realized yesterday was I was watching my son play basketball, and my, uh, my youngest son is a, uh, is a pretty avid, uh, is a pretty good basketball player, and um, I was telling, I think I was talking to John a few, uh, few minutes ago, I was telling John that he spends almost close to seven days in the gym, um, uh, learning about basketball, um, um, practicing his skills. And I, when I, every single time I watch him play, uh, it, it's truly a delight. It's so much fun just watching my 10-year-old play. 
Um, yesterday, when I saw him, when I was like, like, you know, when I was watching him play, he plays for a very, very good team, a very strong team. Uh, it's the Shaker Heights uh, travel team. Every kid in the team has unique talents. They're really, really good at what they do. Uh, their ball handling skills are fantastic. They can dribble. Uh, uh, they, can, they can do the layups. They can do their spin moves. You name it. Um, however, they lost to a team last evening. Um, and it was a good team, but they lost. And uh, I, it, I, I, it, didn't, it just didn't make sense to me. I mean, you've got such good players, and what was going on? Is it the chemistry? Is it, uh, were they not, you know, uh, working together? Were they not communicating? What was going on? And that's something, it's something I've been thinking about, you know, for, for, for a while, actually, since last night, which is crazy. I shouldn't be thinking that, but I was. And driving down to, from, from my office uh, to, col to college just struck me what potentially could have happened. In spite of them having this great skill set, talent, they still were not able to come together as a team and win the game for their coach. So with that said, well, I'm going to, uh, I do have a slide presentation, uh, a PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to go slide by slide. One of the things we, we, we wrestle with is making a good decision in life. Now, do we make good decisions all the time? You know, one of the things about decisions is, think about it for a second. None of us were trained on making decisions, were we? Right the day we were born, living our lives as a year-old, a two-year-old, a three-year-old, a four-year-old, a ten-year-old, a young adult. We make countless decisions you know, over our lifespan. And my guess is we, could have, we would have made close to a million, deci million decisions. Now, when we make decisions, we make decisions based on what we know at that time. We make decisions based on the situation that we are in. We make decisions based on maybe we were in a similar situation a few years ago, a few months ago, a couple of weeks ago, and we make that decision. None of us are born with the skill set, even though we have the innate ability to make decisions, none of us are trained on making decisions, are we? It's a risk we take every single time we make a decision. It's a risk you take when you see someone, when, you, when you're getting married, when you're getting into a relationship, when you're entering into an employment agreement, when you're buying a home. You know, we make multiple, we make decisions every single, every single day. And it's a risk that we take. It's a risk that we take, not knowing, with the hope that it will be a good decision. Now for those entrepreneurs or anyone that's thinking about going, in, you know, going, uh, going on your own, doing business on your own, you know, am I making a good decision? Is the, the, am I making the right decision? Is the decision timely? You know, should I wait for another year? I, did, I waited for 10 years before I, I, before I got married. I waited for another six more years before I had children. Now when I sit back and think about it, you know what, I wish I had, 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 I, I, I had children when I was a lot younger. So it, the decisions, you know, it, it's a risk that you and I take every single day, countless risks that you and I take. There's no guarantee that you love someone you're gonna, that's going to last forever. There's no guarantee that the employment you enter, uh, the employer you choose to work for, that's going to be forever. But we all hope for the best. So when it comes to making decisions in your life about, should I go on my own? What am I going to do? Is this the right time? We always sit back and think, and think, and think, and think, and we talk to a lot of people. When you're driving, you make a decision. 
You don't check with your friends, is it okay for me to make a left turn or change the lane? It's a decision. The decision is made purely based on your past experiences. What you're comfortable with, what you know at that time. What you know at that time. So, you know, decisions are, 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 are very important in our lives. And, uh, you, know, we, you know, people always say, you know, I'm not a risk taker. I'm not a risk taker. You know, we're all risk takers in a way because we make countless decisions. Sometimes we make the same bad decision over and over. Because you take, we, take, we are risk takers, we are, we do. It all depends on what, what motivates you to take that risk. So something to, for you to think about as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur. This is something I always did. I don't know, I know I, I, it was so much fun to actually watch, uh, uh, you know, those of you who stood up and getting ready for your for the competition, I thought Chris was saying that, telling me that it was something very similar to Shark Tank. You know, it, it, it's so much fun. What, I used to daydream a lot. When I'm driving, I dream. You know, when I'm, when I'm in church, I dream. Never paid attention to, to, to any of the sermons. I always dreamed. Dreamed in something that I thought I could be good at. I could, I could make a difference. I always daydreamed, always daydreamed. And see, dreaming is all, I think, dreaming is a skill. I think dreaming is a skill, not that everyone can dream. I think dreaming is a skill. And to dream the impossible, to dream the impossible, that's very important. You know, when I was a child, I would always ask my dad, why is one plus one two? Why can't it be three? And well, he felt that I, there was something wrong with me and uh, I was you know, put through a lot of psychological evaluation. <laughs> but in reality, essentially what it was, was I never settled for something that I was saw, I was able to feel, I was able to hear, I was able to touch. I always questioned it. I always questioned it. And I always dreamt about it. Always dreamt about it. I used to daydream. There are days that I would get kicked out of my class because I was daydreaming. Never paid attention to any of the lectures. Always daydreamed, daydreamed and I always dreamt about things sometimes is just not possible. Something not possible at all. Was I living in a fantasy world? I don't know. But if you're one of that kind of person who dreams every single day, even though if it doesn't make sense to you, or, well, it makes sense to you, actually. Those of us who dream, it makes sense to us. But when you try to explain the dream to someone, they think you're out of your mind. So one of the things I did was I always daydream quite a bit because, I mean, to me, okay, well, you know, for, for, for you know, early part of my life, I didn't quite understand how a plane flies. And I was too lazy to read about it. And I'm trying to figure out how the plane flies. What keeps a plane up? So I always felt a need to keep pushing and trying to make the impossible possible. Early on in my life, as a child, I was reading a story on Napoleon. And, and somewhere I read, I'm not sure if, if this is something I can even say since it, I'm being uh, videotaped, but I, 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 I read somewhere it said that the word impossible is in the, fool of dictionary, uh, in the dictionary of fools. There is no such thing as impossible in life. And I realized that there's no such thing as impossible. Every sing, everything is possible in life. Everything is possible. We may not like the way we go about we may not like the outcomes, but everything is possible in life. There's a process, there's a system that we have to engage, engage in to make the impossible possible. So one of the things is, if you are that entrepreneur sitting here and trying to create something that in your mind you think is possible, but your friends, your relatives, your family members, even your you know, people that you're married to, if they think you're out of your mind, it's a good thing. You are out of your mind. So one, one thing I always did was, I, to this day I daydream. I dream quite a bit actually. Sometimes I even dream things that I, 
I, I, I can't even, I don't know how to accomplish those things, and I dream about those things. So dreaming is something that really helps. Why is dreaming so important? When dreaming becomes part of you, it becomes a habit, then, and you believe in the dream, and you're gonna do everything possible to make the dream a reality. Okay, and I'll talk, I'll talk to you in a bit what I mean by that. Now, <clears throat> one other thing is people always talk about, okay, as an entrepreneur or as a business professional or as a CEO of a company, you have to have a vision. You have to cast a vision. It's, you know, it's, it, we talk about it all the time. We have to cast a vision. What is a vision? Now, as an entrepreneur, when I started this business, I didn't have a vision. I really did not have a vision. Now I do, the reason being is my investors are asking me to have a vision, a cast a vision. They need a five-year vision, 10-year vision, 15 years, where you, where you will be, how do you plan on getting there? But when I started, I did not have a vision. I had an idea. And I thought I could do better than others. I just felt that I could do a little bit better than what's out there. So I really didn't have a vision, but I'm not saying they don't have a vision. Vision is important. See, well, I was a lot, very young, and at that time, I didn't know much about, you know, casting a vision, projecting a vision, and trying to figure a way to get what is a vision, and how do you get that? What are the plans? What are the systems? What are the processes that I have to engage in to accomplish that vision that I'm casting? So vision is important. One of the things I would encourage you guys to do is, as young entrepreneurs, you know, be a visionary. Being a visionary is, doesn't, it, it, you should be able to forecast and project what the needs are, what the demands are, what the pain could be five years down the road, 10 years down the road. The product or the program or the service that you're working on, you're trying to make things happen. You, we, we should be able to see, you should be able to see five years down the road where your product will be, how it will be consumed, what the demand will be. Will there be a demand? Do I need to evolve? Do I need to continue to uh, innovate? Do I, do I have to keep disrupting? Do I disrupt myself? What are the downside of, downsides of disrupting myself? So it, it, vision is important, but it, when I started, I really didn't have a vision. I just had an idea. But now, as I've lived my life, been through challenges, been through struggles, encountered issues, I realized that it's so important for me to have a vision. So as entre young entrepreneurs, one of the things I would encourage you guys to do is, is, you know, try to develop a habit, try to develop that skill set that you can foresee where how your product or your program or your services will be consumed, will be utilized five years down the road. And for you to know that, you have to know the consumers that you serve. You have to be close to the changes that's occurring in the environment. Technology is one of them. It could be many, whatever, whatever pertains to your, to your product and program. So vision is very important. One thing I realized in life is, <clears throat> I have a vision, I have this great idea, but I cannot do it alone. I cannot do it alone. One of the things I did as, uh, as a young man was, I was, I will talk to anyone. I'll connect with anyone. I'll ask questions, there are times, there are times when I would seek for information, when I would seek, for, uh, seek knowledge, I would seek to connect with people. You know, things didn't go to my favor. Things didn't happen the way I wanted. But that never stopped me from doing that. Many, many times, my friends, my, even my own close family members would say I was wasting my time having a cup of coffee with someone. I, one of the things I did was I realized that it is so important for me it is so important for me to surround myself with people that are smarter than me. That are smarter than me. Even today, even today, I surround myself with people that are smarter than me. 
Even today in my organization, I, my senior management, I surround myself with people that are smarter than me. I don't, li I don't surround myself with people that say yes to me all the time. I encourage them to challenge me, question me. Why do I do what I do? And why do I do it the way I do it? And I'll tell you, it's a very good example. When I started as a you know, young man at the age of 26, 27, I mean, I had friends. I was like you guys, having a good time, partying all the time, you know, having a great time, and had few friends. But today, just connecting with people and networking with people. If you ask me, Gene, can you help me with something, I can actually find a way to help you. I'll give an example. Two years ago, uh, someone that I knew from, uh, from the West Side reached out to me and said, Gene, we're trying to take these, our kids uh, to the White House. And we know that we have to go through this background checks and you know, we've got to go through this process. Um, we don't have the time. Is there any way you can make it happen? And I did. And that's the power of connection. That's the power of networking. You always connect with people selflessly. Connect with people selflessly. As entrepreneurs, you need people around you. You need people that would encourage you, that would support you, that understands who you are. You know, many times when you network, you know, one of the things I, I, I do is, to this day, my, if you talk to my sales and mar uh, to my um, uh, marketing team, I have never used my business cards that I printed in 2004. That I still have that box. I, I'm the, even though I'm the CEO of the company, I've got the oldest cards here still. Okay? Reason being is when I go to when I go to meetings, and I'll tell you it's a bad habit of mine. I don't carry my cards, I always forget. And I, I'm very forgetful. As I'm getting older, actually, it gets even worse. Um, but when I go, I ask for the business card. The reason I do that is, well, I, it was organic. First of all, I was forgetful, so I was embarrassed, so I have to ask for a business card, but it became a habit of mine now. When I meet people, I'll ask for the business card, I'll ask for the contacts. Number one, reason being is, I'm in control of where this relationship would go. I will be able to go back to my office, email them, or text them, or call them, and set up meetings, or have a conversation, or send a note. I always ask, what is it I can do for them? To this day, I never ask what I want from, from them. Building relationships are very, very important. I know in this day and age, you know, the lot of texting and Snapchatting and stuff like that I'm telling you, those are good, but face-to-face -face personal relationship is very important. To this day, many of us and many of you, as you get older, as you start doing business, you will do business with people that you trust, that you believe in, that you can count on. You know, so the key thing is, you know, always be selfless and ask what you can do for them and continue to work with them and you will see you will see what a blessing it would be for you. And I, it, I mean, truly, you know, those practices, you know, happened to me organically. Unfortunately, I didn't have the, 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 the opportunity to learn about entrepreneurship or to really take a, a very formal course on entrepreneurship. Everything that I learned throughout my life has happened organically and has happened in a way that I learned and, and, and you know, through struggles and challenges. But one of the things I realized, it's so important for me to be for others. Very important. So connect, connection, networking selflessly has been a huge factor in my life. <clears throat> one of the things I would encourage is, uh, I always felt that it's not good enough to be pretty good. I need to be great. One of the things I realized in my life is, there are only two things, and I tell my kids all the time, that they think I'm, I'm, out, I'm crazy and I'm out of my mind. Either you're great at something, or you're, you're terrible at something. As entrepreneurs, there's nothing in between. There's no mediocrity, there's no, it's good, I'm good enough. No, 
When it comes to a true entrepreneurship, is entrepreneurship is where you are able to impact people around you, where you're able to influence people around you. The only way you can impact and influence is based on how far your reach is. When you're good at something, you're, I realize that I can only impact people that are within my closer circle. When I'm great at something, I can influence and impact people across the globe. And it's very true in my own life, in my, 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 my personal story. And, I, and I'll tell you, you know, if we have time, I'll share something very interesting and um, kind of strange and funny, but it, this is something I always felt that either I'm great at something or I'm, 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 I'm really not that great or not good. So again, I don't know how much, how helpful this is, and I'll, I don't want to put a lot of pressure on you guys, but this is what I followed. I always felt it's not good enough to be pretty good. I need to be great at whatever I do. Now, <clears throat> what's the point of being alive if you don't at least try to do something remarkable? OK? I know it's kind of like strange, sounds strange. But in reality, when you look at people that are great, you know, if you look at Elon Musk, if you look at yeah, Bill Gates, Tim Cook, Steve Jobs, these guys are remarkable people. They were just not good at what they did. They were great at what they did. They were great at what they did. When you even look at our leaders that every one of us admire, they were not just good leaders. They were great leaders. They always left their footprint that you and I talk about very often. So this is something that I always believe in. This is, again, I didn't know as a young entrepreneur. I did not know that. This is something I started learning and realizing. See, when I was as young as you guys, you know, I want to be the most powerful, wealthiest, popular CEO by the age of 30. I want to be a big Wall Street guy. And I was getting there. I mean, I work very hard. I, I mean, I, even to this day, I was telling Chris that I get up 3 in the morning. I start my day at 3. It's important for me to, not that I'm an early riser. You know, when, when, when my friends look at me and they go like, it's impossible. I mean, it's hard to believe that you are what you are. Because in my college days, I never went to classes. I used to party all night and sleep two, three days straight. I'm not kidding. You may think that, you know, I'm serious. That's what I did. And, and now I look at my life, it's just the opposite. I, I get up at 3 in the morning. And I'm almost done by 6.37. But again, the reason I do that is based on what the, 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 the situation that I was in. So I, again, organically I allowed the work situation or the need-based situation, the environment, the pain that I need to address, control and manage my engagement throughout the day. So, you know, it's something for you to think about. It's really something to think about because, you know, I'll tell you something. We all have different DNA, right? I mean, our, our DNA is unique. Our genes, our genetic, you know, mapping is unique, right? In a similar fashion, every single one of them has a skill that no one else has. Every one of us have a skill that no one else has. Sometimes we don't realize those skills until we are 40 or 50. But we are all blessed with a skill, a talent, a very unique talent. The, it's important for us to find out what that is. And how, do you know how you find that out? Something that you're super passionate about, something you're, you will do whatever it takes, something you're great at, and you will do it without expecting a reward. And that's your skill set. That's the uniqueness that you have, and every one of us have it. Every one of us have it. You have to ask yourself, what is it you will do? No matter what, I'm extremely passionate about it, I'll do whatever it takes, and I will do it without expecting a reward. See, reward is, comes later on in life. 
And I'll talk to you a little bit about how, how reward comes into play. I talked about passion a few minutes ago. I always say, people always ask me, why do I do what I do? Gene, you should be in advertising or something to do with entertainment. Why elderly care? The very first day when I saw my client, I was 25 years old, I believe, or 24, I'm not sure. When I walked in, you know, and I saw this elderly client, by the way, I got fired the very first day. In my, uh, I, I got fired because they thought, the reason I got fired was they didn't think I was good enough. And they were right. And that, that propelled me to really understand what the reality is, what is it I need to do to continue to shine. One of the biggest fears I have in my life, people, I was talking to someone two days ago, they said, well, Eugene, you're, you know, you're all set, you've got this, you've got that. My biggest fear is, what, what, the reason I get up every single morning is that my, my, my fear of failure, I'm afraid that I'll fail. And that's what drives me. So I always say, you know, I'm very passionate about it, and, and how do I go about doing it? Uh, my thing is, if you're passionate about it, you may not have the skill set, you may not have the talents, you may not have the education, nor the wisdom, but you're passionate about it, you're dedicated, you want to do it, and if you think you will do whatever it takes to make that happen, I say, just do it. Be bold. Every single one of them that you see, that you admire, that you think is really cool, they were bold. Can anyone tell me how many times Elon Musk declared bankruptcy? Check it out, Google. I'm not gonna tell you, Google. The key thing is, see, we're always afraid of failing, right? I always say this, I see problems, challenges, issues in life as an opportunity. An opportunity to learn something, an opportunity to get better. See, if you see a problem as a problem, I did. If you see an issue as, an, uh, as a, something, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? It will bog you down, it will drain you. But if you see a problem as an opportunity, you will realize that all your creative juices, everything that you have, starts firing up. And you will start looking at things from a very different perspective. And it, it happened to me. There are a lot of things I was afraid in my life. And I would not make a decision, even though I was very passionate about it. But when I started seeing every, and every challenge and every problem as an opportunity for me to do better, for me to get better, my, I, at this point, I'll, I'll be very honest with you, there's nothing I really worries me anymore. I'm not afraid of anything anymore. The only fear I have is that I'll fail. So one of the things is I would encourage you to think about, you know, when, when you feel passionate about something, you've got it, you've got everything what you, you need to make it happen, be bold and just do it. What's the worst that can happen? You'll fail. That's it. Then try again. If you read up Steve Jobs, you will see how many times he failed. No one talks about failures because it's not sexy. Everyone talks about accomplishments. Every leader that you see that, are, that, that, that is influential, not powerful, influential, that has made a mark in our lives, you will see they have more failures than successes in life. The, the key is how do you go about taking it by its horn and overcoming it. Now, one of the things I always tell people is, you know, I say, do not let others compel you into doing what they want you to do because they will if you let them. See, we all have agendas in life. We all have agendas in life. Whether we are conscious or not, we all have agendas in life. 
Think about this. When you go to work in the morning, you have an agenda. You want to get things accomplished. As soon as you walk into your uh, um, office, everything that you wanted to accomplish is not getting accomplished. You're getting frustrated because an employee walks in. Or a client walks in, or a consumer walks in. They walk in with their agenda. And they mess your agenda up. Similarly, you have a dream, you have a vision, you want to make things happen. That's your agenda. But there are always things, factors around you that would derail you. Fear, pain, lack, fear of lack. What if I fail? What if I, what if this, but, however, all of these, all of these factors. So but the thing is, if you believe in something and you're passionate about, about it and you possess the knowledge and the wisdom to accomplish it, just do it. Just do it. Well, if you don't possess the knowledge or the wisdom or the education like the way I did, I never had, I'm no, people think, I, people think I'm an Alzheimer expert, I'm not. I, I'm truly not, I'm still learning. But what I did was, Seven years ago, when I started this program called Swiss, I got a lot of pushback from the industry. A lot of people said a lot of things to me. And it was not good. It was very discouraging. It was mean. I was taunted on social media. I, I pushed, pulled myself out of LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. I, went, I totally went dark. I totally went dark because I didn't want to surround myself with negative comments, which I, it really gets, no matter how strong you are, it will seep in and would, will start affecting and impacting your decision-making process. What I did was I went back and read neuroanatomy, pathophysiology, back to back, cover to cover, so that if anyone has any doubts or any questions about the design, the program, that, that I design, then I'm, I'm able to have a very healthy conversation. Not that I want to be defensive. It is my responsibility to educate the world. All of a sudden, until 2011, no one talked about treating Alzheimer's disease. No one talked about treating dementia care, dementia, uh, individuals with dementia. I came and said, I can treat Alzheimer's and I can treat dementia. That was a very bold statement. Dementia is, there was a lot of confusion. There's a difference between treatment and cure. When I said treatment, they thought I can cure the disease. And I never said you can cure the disease. You can't. But you have to make, take a very bold position. And the reason I did that is, as of today, as of today, only 9% of Americans have zero risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. Only 9%. There's something I need to do today. I can't wait for another 30 years or 40 years. What? There's a very good chance I would have the disease. I need to do something today. And so you all feel that way. All entrepreneurs here, you will feel that way. You have to do something today. You're convinced, you're, you, it's, it's, it, you're motivated. Tell you, I need to do something today. Do it. If you don't have the wisdom, go get it. Now, you, we all have Google. See, when I was growing up, we didn't have Google. Now, we all have Google. Well, Wikipedia is not a source, by the way. My, that's what my 10-year-old my said. So, but there are tons of information out there that kind of guides you, that may not be the source, but kind of guides you. So, you know, if you believe in it, do it. One thing is, I, the key thing is to address the pain. All of us have pain. Every consumer has pain. Pain is nothing but a need. What is it your product or what is it your, what, or your offering or your services? Is it addressing a pain? I'm actually running short of time, so I'm going to move real fast here. So address the pain and address the convenience. Okay, those, those of you who are very young, you know, who use Uber and Facebook and um, uh, eBay and things like that, you know, when I was 30 years old, we didn't have all that stuff. Okay, did we need it? No, not really. 
But now we need it, right? Now I need Amazon. I don't even buy a bottle, a water bottle from the grocery store. I just go to go online and I use Amazon. I'm get the, who's gonna, who wants to carry the bottle of water all the way down up you know, 20 flights of steps? You know, Amazon is gonna bring it right into my, to my doorstep. So that's the convenience part, okay? Pain and convenience, these are the two important things that I think, that I felt that if I'm able to identify that, and if I'm able to address it, today's pain, what would the pain be five years down the road? What would the pain be 10 years down the road? What would the pain be 15 years down the road? The demographics are changing. You know, from baby boomers, X, Gen Xs. Gen X, we have millennials. From millennials, we have the Gen Ys. Their approach, their attitude, the way they look at things, everything changes. And it will change even faster than what, the way it did 10 years ago. Technology is making it faster and quicker. See, that's one other thing. I'm in my early 40s, uh, but I'll tell you, I surround myself with people that are in their 20s because I want to know what they're thinking because in 30 years, I'll be serving them. I want to know what they're thinking, how they're reading, where they're getting the information from, how they're consuming, what their thoughts are. One other thing is you have to be radically open-minded, radically open-minded as an entrepreneur. Okay, you cannot be, I, one of the things I realized, I cannot be fixed on certain things that I believe in. I gotta be radically open-minded. Radically open-minded is okay, I'm gonna, you know, I'm open-minded. No, that's not radically open-minded. Radically open-minded is listening to people and understanding their point, their perspective. How do they conclude to what they concluded? The key thing is if you're, if you're radically open-minded, you will find ways to serve the people that you intend to serve. Many companies fail. When you, look at, when you look at BlackBerry, when you look at Palm Pilots, Palm Pilots was the first smartphone, it's the best smartphone. BlackBerry was the next best smartphone. I mean, they're not even business anymore. What happened to them? They failed to innovate. They failed to listen to their consumers. BlackBerry has over 200 patents. Other corporations are buying those patents. Samsung bought a few. Uh, LG bought a few, uh, Apple bought a few. It's no point keeping all that information to you. The world needs it. You gotta find a way to get it to the consumer. That's the most important thing. Being radically open-minded is very important. Understanding people's pain, addressing their convenience, I think, you know, is something that, that really helped us as an organization. Now, last but not the least, Okay, I've got this brilliant idea. I've got this great concept. I need to raise, I, I need money. There are different ways of raising money. There are different ways of raising money. And the way I raised money is I went to this, you know, this one individual who happened to have a lot of money. And, uh, and one of the things I would encourage you to do is no matter how great your program is, how great your offering is, how great your product is, you should be able to translate that to economics. It's very important. Very, very important. Not that your investors are not worried about what you have. The investors are in the business of what? Making money. If they give you a dollar, how soon can they get the dollar back? And how quickly you don't just return a dollar, you return $12 for every dollar. That's 12%. Makes sense? 12 times, I'm sorry, not 12%, 12 times. It really depends. You have to have the ability to transfer, to translate your offerings and your service and programs in terms of dollars, in terms of economics, and there's nothing wrong. We provide great care. If I go and say, we provide great care, give me $9 million, you think I'm gonna get it? No. I thought I would when I was 27, 20 years of age. You know, great care, great service, this phenomenal design, and the cutting edge, it's gonna be one of its kind in the world. You know, we're gonna get reviews, people are gonna write about this. No, the most important thing is, even to this day, I was in Chicago three weeks ago, I ended up raising close to $900 million for the next 10 years to build 81 projects. And the, my focus was, I, had to, I have to speak their language. Their language is pure economics. They, they wanna make sure they understand the, 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 the product. It's important because it's just not economics alone for them. But you, we as entrepreneurs, sometimes we're shy. 
of talking in, talking in dollars, in figures. That's something that I would encourage you guys to start thinking about and translating. I mean, try, to, try to find a way to translate all of your products, all your offerings that you're trying to develop in terms of dollars. You know, some of you that watch Shark Tank, it, it's all about, okay, how fast do I get my money back? And how much, how much can I own you? You know, it, it's very hard for entrepreneurs like us. I don't want anyone owning me. That's why I'm an entrepreneur. That's why I went on my own. I don't want to give any, my, any I don't want to give you my action, my piece of action. But sometimes you've got to figure a way to make it happen. So one of the things I would encourage, encourage you to do is present the way they want to hear, not how you want to tell. Present the information the way they want to hear it and not how you want to tell it. And I learned this, I was, flying to, I was flying somewhere overseas for a conference, and there was a missionary sitting right next to me. And he was from Seattle, and I think he was going to, if I'm not mistaken, he was going to an eastern part of India, which is anti-missionary, anti-Christians. And he was going to preach the gospel. I was intrigued by this man. I said, what's wrong with this guy? He's going to get killed. And I very politely asked him, and he was very passionate about the gospel. He was very passionate about what he believed in. He was very passionate about the world has to benefit from the gospel. And that's when he told me, Gene, I always share the gospel the way they want to hear it, not like the way I want to tell them. And many, many times, that's what happens with invest investors. We always get so excited about the product. We keep talking about our product, our offering. They understand it. All, lastly, they say, OK, Let's talk about economics. And then all of a sudden, why, why is this guy interested in money? I mean, that's all he's interested in. He's, he's so evil. In reality, the guy, is in the, the guy or the gal is in the business of making money. OK? Now, I've got to try to finish, wrap this up in about two minutes. OK, <clears throat> this is very important for me. I always, these are my beliefs. I always felt that love is more powerful than hate. Uh, you know, in my business, you know, we have caregivers, and we expect the caregivers to love and, and, and show affection to the clients they serve, which is the older clients. Now, if I don't share, if I don't show, demonstrate love and affection, if they don't get to experience the love and affection from me, from my staff, how can I expect them to do something that they, in the first place, have never shared, uh, never experienced it? So one of the things I realized is love is more powerful than hate. Love is, to me, love is about, I'm not, a, I'm not a crazy, you know, about hippie here, but see, love is so important in life. You know, try loving someone. It's easy to hate someone, actually. Try, love some, try loving someone. One of the things I always believed is, you, we as entrepreneurs, we as business leaders, we always have to plant trees that we'll never get to grow, see grow, fully grown. I'm a runner. When I was in Chicago running one day, you know, I was running by the lake. I, I, mean, I, was, I was tired, exhausted. I stopped, and I looked up, and I, I saw this beautiful, well-grown trees right on Lakeshore, uh, the, right by the, by the lake. And I'm looking at it, and I'm going, this, these trees were not planted yesterday. They were planted 100 years ago. And how did that person or persons or those individuals know that one day I will stand exhausted and tired and that's going to offer shade and breeze? See, that's what true entrepreneurship is, in my mind. We plant trees that we never get to see fully grown. So it was, it, it's something that I real, and it's something that we as an, as an organization, as a CEO of my company, I try to cultivate that, is to continue to sow in people's lives, try to, you know, start planting saplings, little plants, and, and let, the, let it blossom. You know, it may not happen today, it could be 100 years down the road, but there's always people that would benefit from it. One of the things I always ask myself, again, I didn't know when I was a 24-year-old, I, I learned this when I was in my late 30s. What is my job on this planet? What is that, what is that need, needs doing that I know something about that probably won't happen unless I take the responsibility for it? Essentially, what it means is, okay, why am I on this planet? See, we all have a purpose in this life. There's a reason we all, have, we all exist. We're not just, you know, just hanging around. 
We all have the unique talent, and there's a purpose in our life, and there's a reason why we exist. Okay, so the key thing is, you should ask yourself, is there something, in, something that only I can do? I have to do it to bring that change. If I don't do it, who else will? So when you, as entrepreneurs, you'll see that things that you're very passionate about is something that you strongly believe in. Always believe this, if you cannot risk, you cannot grow. If you cannot grow, you cannot become your best. If you cannot become your best, you cannot be happy. And if you cannot be happy, what else matters? Okay, I didn't say that, that was Dr. Viscott. And it's true. Every single one of us thrive for happiness. And it, it, this, this particular you know, statement does make, make sense. I always say this, life is not just about us, it's about people around us. Our creation and existence is to impact the larger good. You know, that's our purpose in life. And last but not the least, I, I, you know, this is my, my thing, to simply dream is a natural skill. To, the, to dream the impossible is a God-given gift. When we dream the impossible, and to make the impossible possible, we only have two options. Number one, acquire skills, wisdom, and knowledge to make the impossible possible, or depend on the Lord, for those of us who, are, who believe in God, to make the impossible possible. Dreaming the impossible and making it possible is when inventions occur. Inventions impact the larger good and serve the mankind. How many, of, how many saw Apple an apple fall from the tree before Sir Isaac Newton did. How many? Many did, many. Apples, I see an apple fall from the tree, apple fall from the tree, apple fall. But Isaac Newton decided to do something about it. And that's what put man on the moon. Things that you, we see every single day around us may just look natural, may just look it has to happen, it's there for a, you know, for a reason, but my, I would encourage you today to ask questions. Challenge what you see. Don't, don't accept what you have. You have to push it, and that's what Elon Musk does every single day. That's what Uber does. That's what Amazon does. That's what all the innovators do. So as entrepreneurs, I would encourage you to do that. Now with that said, I want to close my presentation with a, with a small video. I want to show you, it's a, just a, a quick two minute video. It's truly, it's truly, I, I think, uh, you know, the ones that, you're gonna, that you would see is true American greatness. And the one that you see are very unique. They're very innovative. They pushed the envelope, and they were great at what they did. So uh, I will wrap my presentation with this video. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, I think I still have two more minutes. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> Yo, no, no, that's okay. Uh, make it very quick. You know, our human brain is about three pounds heavy. 
and um, uh, there are over two billion neurons, that, that are the cells in the brain. And there are over three trillion connections, we call them synapses. So when you take the neurons and the synapses and you put them together, you and I can go to the moon and come back. And that's what is in our three pound brain. For every heartbeat, about 30% of the blood supply goes to the brain. So essentially the blood carries nutrition, oxygen, everything the brain needs to stay healthy, for the neurons to stay healthy. So know, knowing this fact, there's something called as neuroplasticity. You and I, we have complete control over our brain. We can mold the brain we, the way we want. That we can shape the brain the way we want. Okay, and we do this throughout our lives. And simple thing as ability to put your shirt on. You don't think twice when you're putting your shirt on or your blouse on. The reason being is you've done that over 450 times. So anything that you learn, and you, 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 anything you want to master, you have to repeat the same task over 450 times. And it has to be errorless. Well, if you do that, a neural network will be formed in the brain. That's what the latest research shows. So that's why you and I, we can text an email and still you know, keep driving, because we've done this over and over. But however, when you come down with the, Alzheimer, with the disease process, the simple things like ability to learn, dress and bathe and comb your hair and, and make good cognitive decisions, they go away. The, what we do is, the way we go about treating is, we pick a task that we would like the client to master. And we would repeat that task through activities and exercises. And we repeat it over 450 times. And the only way you can do that is, at a minimum, you have to practice three times a day. See, you know, as a therapist, I can't do it. As a doc, the physicians can't do it in the clinics. The only ones that can do that is caregivers. The caregivers that make anywhere between 10 to $12. They have the ability to treat. So essentially what we do is we increase the blood supply to the brain through activities and exercises. And we, the task that we want the client to master, we engage them in the task you know, and have them repeat the task over and over. If we're able to get three repetitions, we're looking at close to three months for that one particular task. And last but not the least, the things that, are, that they're able to do, we'll have them do it over and over and over. You and I, if we stop doing certain things, we'll forget. That's a normal tendency. But the brain is super, super complex and smart. You can actually retrain your brain. So essentially what we do is we train the brain. You're very welcome. Thank you so much.